The River Yare rises in agricultural Norfolk and four miles from Norwich flows past the University of East Anglia. On Tuesday, the 14th of April, 1978, people began to arrive to celebrate the university's newest extension. It looked like a huge aluminium box, and it encompassed, in the Vice-Chancellor's words, a most magnificent gift. People came by bus and train, by car, and a few on foot. Mr. Martin Butlin. They came from all corners of Britain, some from the continent, and a few even from America for this occasion. Miss Maria Bergamo. Mr. Brian Williams. They were a diverse lot. Among them were well-known names. Millionaires, gallery owners, sculptors, painters, journalists, prominent politicians, and academics. Mr. and Mrs. Compton. They came because they all had one thing in common. They were the friends of Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury, and the building they were here to open was the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts. Dr. Frank Thistlethwaite, the Vice Chancellor, spoke. Today is free or private view for all of us, their many friends, in the enjoyment of the visual arts. So it's, it's not an occasion for speeches, and neither Sir Robert nor I propose to make one. The building housed the most unusual, and probably the best, private collection of fine art to be assembled in England for many decades. collection which had its roots in the private lifestyle of Sir Robert Sainsbury and his wife Lisa. Their house in London was filled almost to overflowing with works of art. Most of them were of impeccable quality. Sir Robert's own room had been specially designed by a Dutch Indonesian designer, Ko Lang Yi, to blend his art, the books that surrounded them, and his own life. This room is an expression of the Sainsbury's approach to collecting. A collection like this is not a thing apart from life, but something to be entwined with it. A Henry Moore drawing, sculptural object in a landscape, drawn in 1939, is mixed freely with a wood carving of a fisherman's god from the Pacific Cook Islands. Bob Sainsbury was born in 1906. He was educated at Halebury and Cambridge, and spent his professional life devoted to the family supermarket business. His spare time, however, has been devoted to the fine arts. He was chairman of the Tate Gallery for four years, but still maintains his own highly personal view on the ownership of art. In my experience, the people who tell you that works of art should always be owned by the state and be in museums where everybody can see them. I always know that such people are not interested in art, because if they were, they would realize that one of the great pleasures of art is being able, if it's an object, to handle it, to be able to alter the angle at which you look at it. In the case of a picture, to be able to look at it at all lights and in all moods. It has always been a characteristic of his to pay minute attention to detail. Yet his approach to art is strictly non-academic. I tend to divide works of art into those I like, that is to say, those that excite me, and those that don't. Reaction to works of art, in my opinion, is unrelated to intelligence or education. It is something one is born with. For over 40 years now, Sir Robert has shared his collecting life with his wife, Lisa. They have formed a partnership during which they have never disagreed on the purchase of a single piece. He is a judge of shape and form. She has the eye for color and texture. 
I had a marvellous idea about the console table upstairs. I mean, would you like to come and see it, or do you want to... I'll take this you take Between them, they have bought consistently and with the same philosophy. They derive enormous pleasure from displaying and handling their pieces at home and sometimes rearranging them, trying new combinations. I think that experience is very different from knowledge. People have said to me, oh, you must have acquired a lot of knowledge. I never pretend to know about art. But I do say I've had a long experience, and one acquires a, a sort of instinct. What about it, Annie? I yeah. think it looks very nice. Good. Very good with the Picasso. Fine. OK. On the 4th of January, 1978, a special security firm was engaged to take the entire collection from its home in London to the basement of the new building at the University of East Anglia. 580 paintings and sculptures, including many pieces of primitive art, were unloaded that day. It was a cargo worth a fortune. But more important than that, it represented the result of a lifetime's exercise in taste for two people and the creative expressions of many artists, both known and anonymous. The pieces looked incongruous, jumbled in the basement, and the long task of sorting, measuring and recording began. The Sainsbury's had decided to give their entire collection to the university, and with it a building which would house the collection, plus the School of Fine Arts. To the, to the doorway in the glass over there, yeah. so that's a key connecting route, yeah. so that's the main traffic. And just also the designer was a young architect called Norman Foster. His work had attracted both the Sainsbury's and the university. Foster was better known abroad. His ideas were considered to be fresh and exciting. Foster and his associates are highly preoccupied with the environment. The whole project was designed so that the external landscape would blend as much as possible with the inside of the building. The relationship to the, to the lake and to the landscape is really quite important in the, in the siting. And the way that, you know, the thing closes up on the, on the north side. I think it was something we talked about on that building. Foster likes to talk about his own projects. He attended the press conference given at the opening. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to us to have you all here, and we very much appreciate the number of you who've thought it worth your while. The press conference was greeted by Dr. Thistlethwaite. He was faced by a fairly small but specialist group of writers. He began by explaining the anatomy of the building. A long spinal basement is covered by a vast hall the size of Wembley football pitch. The hall is divided into unequal areas by the construction of two mezzanine floors with offices underneath them. This conference was on one of these and looked down onto the School of Fine Arts. Beyond was the main exhibition area and behind was the restaurant. Well, now, I think that is all by way of geographic explanation and I would like, having welcomed you here, to invite you to move around in the building and the collection between now and one o'clock when, if you would like to come back, we will have a press conference here uh, when I shall invite Sir Robert Sainsbury himself uh, and Mr. Norman Foster, the architect, to join me in answering your questions. Uh, my name is Stephen Gardner of The Observer. How, Sir Robert, did you go about the business of selecting such a good architect? Well, I... Shall I say I selected the architect in the same instantaneous way as um, I react to uh, a, a work of art when I see it. I spent two days, uh, amongst other things, two days going round uh, looking at certain buildings by a variety of architects. And when I got to a certain building, I said, OK, the man who did that is the man for me. And I then made contact the in time with the university. They approved. And that was that. It was as simple as that. It's exactly the same as when I see a work of art, I know if I want to possess it, and I knew immediately that the man who produced that particular building was the man who could produce the sort of building that my wife and I would like.
Norman Guardian. I was wondering whether Sir Robert could put into words how he felt about this building as a work of art or as a building. Somebody who uh, knows both the building very well and the collection extremely well said, Bob, you do realize, don't you, that the building is the best object in the collection? Well, uh, I'm not only at three quarters true from my point of view, uh, in the sense that I'm often asked, which is my favorite work of art? And that, if I may say so, is a bloody silly question. I have no favorite, I, and uh, I know no one to me is the greatest. I think that there are certain works which are greater than others, certain which mean more to me. But I will go along with the unknown gentleman to the extent that I think the building is one of the, the, the greatest works in the collection. Um, what I feel about it is, is quite simple. I know this sounds, what I'm going to say, extremely arrogant. But when people say to me, do I like it? The answer is quite simple. It wouldn't be here if my wife and I didn't like it <laughs> because we've been in on it from the word go. And I can only say I'm very proud indeed to have been associated in a very small way with what I think will be regarded as a very important early work of a great architect. In fact, the Sainsbury's were associated in a very big way with the development of the building. It was designed not with a written brief, but came to life as a result of continuous consultation with the university and between the Sainsbury's and the architect. They toured Scandinavia and Germany together, comparing notes and ideas on new museums and art galleries. It was a building which evolved rather than was designed. One man who joined Foster Associates late in the project was George Sexton. He came over from America, where he had gained a lot of experience in mounting and lighting exhibitions. His problem was the sheer variety of the Sainsbury's choice. From now, he was going to have to learn about both the Sainsbury's and their collection in order to find the right way of displaying it. After all, there were 14 scholars working on the definitive catalogue. There were works spanning the entire world and over 5,000 years. It was an immense task, and among those who were handling the collection, some pieces quickly became favourites. This Benin bronze head from Nigeria was one. It's a magnificent piece of workmanship from 16th century Africa. On its own, it made the collection famous. As work progressed, it became evident that the favourites at UEA were very often those which had been favourites in the Sainsbury family too. Among them was the first major piece of sculpture that Bob Sainsbury bought. It was a three-foot-high carving of a mother and child in green Haunton stone, bought from Henry Moore in 1933 for £160. That year, it represented half Henry Moore's income. gets pale, 
Since 1933, Bob Sainsbury has had a continuous friendship with Henry Moore. He has regularly visited Henry Moore's sculpture garden at his home near Much Haddam in Hertfordshire. Occasionally, he's bought a piece. But what is more important is that they've held a dialogue which has lasted 45 years and during which their ideas have matured, each understanding the other as they grew older. Something in the world um, has a fundamental meaning for you. I mean, a mother and child uh, idea is the same as the big and the little. And the protection of the, I mean, it's all mixed up. The interior, exterior forms that I came to is a mother and child uh, idea. It's the same. Well, even in exterior and in, yes, interior. Yes, and interior, exterior, exterior, exterior form, it's the same there. as the uh, one form protecting another one, which is what the mother and the child do. Certain themes recur throughout the life's work of an artist. With Henry Moore, the mother and child is one of them, the relationship between the greater and the smaller. It's experience like this which gives Bob Sainsbury pleasure. At Much Haddam and elsewhere, he's worked hard with artists, trying to understand what they're doing and why. He wants to know what motivates an artist, what materials he's using, and where they come from. Uh, come from Portugal. Is that related yeah. in any way to uh, mother and child? No, not, not, not this particular one. No, it's more a kind of animal form. It's a question and answer dialogue, with Bob Sainsbury forever prodding, probing, seeking out bits of information and matching them up with others. He may disclaim academic knowledge, but this approach has made him a formidable expert on 20th century art in Europe. I mean, here you see, yeah, I like a big eye, but a, uh, a, a, little, a young bird is just a great big bag of softness mm -hmm. <laughs> with a beak and a big eye. And the, this, these are meant to be like... Uh, uh, what, like is this? what is this? Thing? This is a black marble, like this. This is also... Uh, this is a black... Italian marble. It's been said that Bob Sainsbury is himself a frustrated artist. Although he's denied this suggestion, there's no doubt that his approach to works of art is direct and personal. The enjoyment that he derives from them is forceful and creative. He touches and feels an object. He walks around it, allowing himself to be stimulated by every aspect. But I like the back view too. She's got a, yes, she's got a um, like a cat in front of the fire. The Sainsbury's friendship is not just confined to artists who are already household names. Just as Henry Moore was neglected and unknown in 1933, so too was John Davis when he was one of the last recipients of the Sainsbury Award. And even later, when he made this head of a little prince. The Sainsbury Award was a financial one, given annually to sculptors as they left art school. It was given every year from 1959 until 1975, and it enabled a sculptor to work freely for a year without having to support himself by teaching or taking on other jobs. John Davis is among those who were given the award, and like Henry Moore, it was to Bob Sainsbury that he made his first major sale in 1970. Preparations for the exhibition were continuing apace. As the winter of 1978 gave way to a wet spring, 
it became possible to transform a mud bath of a building site into a landscaped entity. The building was by now completed on the outside, but there was still plenty to do inside. Foster Associates described this as a low-cost, high-technology building. They considered that the on-site craftsman was a thing of the past, and that items like this lift and its glass shaft should be specially designed, made at the factory and merely assembled on site. Nonetheless, being a one-off job, it took some assembling and a very considerable amount of testing. The technology, though, was not technology for its own sake. It was there for a defined purpose, that of housing the collection. Much of the feeling of the building can be understood when you know that Norman Foster is a keen glider pilot. The high-performance glider is to him a machine of technological perfection mixed with the simplest classical elegance. So it is with his buildings. Are they on, George? The walls and ceilings are not walls and ceilings in the normal sense. They consist of great lengths of Venetian blinds which line the inside of the building. They are controlled from a central desk and at the touch of a button they can be adjusted to change the intensity and distribution of natural light entering the building. Gradually then the collection took shape in its new surroundings. At this point, nothing could have been further removed from the quiet intimacy of the Sainsbury's London home than this vast, impersonal and incomplete hall. At this stage, the final result, the transformation of private into public, was still only in the minds of those who were working on it. And some still said it would never be ready in time. In the reception area, 20 trees which had been specially grown in a nutrient solution were brought in. The operation was supervised by Lanning Roper, the landscape architect. It was all part of the attempt to mix the outside landscape with the inside environment. March was the month in which George Sexton faced the job of welding together the ideas of everyone contributing to the project. The whole was now being made from the parts. To the Sainsbury's, display had always mattered, so they designed a highly versatile way of exhibiting sculpture. The pedestals upon which most of the smaller items were shown came in two different heights, so that objects could be raised to eye level without an ugly system of mountings. Meanwhile, in another part of the building, the School of Fine Arts and Music began to move its collection of 90,000 slides and nearly twice as many photographic prints into its new quarters. This was the first real contact that the university had had with the new building. And it was from the university that there came voices of dissent and misgiving about the whole project. How much was it costing? Was it really needed? Who was paying for what? The School of Fine Arts found itself faced with an experiment which could turn out to be highly beneficial to its future or a disaster. The whole school had been redesigned so that it could be grouped around the slide collection as it had been in the early days of temporary accommodation. But the school was also to be integrated with the collection itself. This meant that defined territories and their established boundaries, like lecture theatres and some teaching areas, were broken down. The staff felt a loss of privacy. They felt uneasy, threatened even. They faced a whole new concept of teaching and learning. But what they stood to gain was enormous.
Just as a theme may recur in the work of a single artist, so there are themes and repetitions in Robert and Lisa Sainsbury's collection. Almost all of it is figurative, variations on the human form. With a collection as broad as this, there's a lot to be learnt by displaying objects in various combinations. Its arrival, for the students at least, would mean a substantial change of outlook. In order to display objects to their best advantage, Foster Associates designed the layout to a set of rules. Every piece of sculpture must be visible from 360 degrees. Every pedestal must be set against a blank screen. Whether it's a life-size sculpture like John Davis's Bucket Man, or a tiny cycladic head an inch and three quarters high, each piece must be displayed so that it stands on its own and is not lost in this vast building. Then, towards the end of March, the whole project suddenly came together. Now the collection was no longer dotted around a private house, but formally displayed, encapsulated in perspex boxes. The philosophy, though, still remained. These were private pieces, a reflection of one couple's life. But the central question was still unanswered. Was it going to be possible to keep the privacy of this collection in a public place? The exhibition was set. There remained only one task, and that was to light it. Lighting is a vital and integral part of the Sainsbury Centre. By day, there is control over natural light, but 675 special effects lights were brought in to augment this. A special gantry was designed above the exhibition area so that lights could be moved without disturbing events below. As light and use of light is so important to the Sainsbury Centre, this was to be George Sexton's most important contribution to the exhibition. Tuesday, the 4th of April. 332 guests at the Sainsbury's had arrived for the private view. The university had probably never entertained on such a scale. And in the new restaurant, the catering staff were plunged straight into the deep end. It was a spread to tickle many a sophisticated palate, 
and it was all done without rehearsal. Today was the day the entire building was thrown into use for the first time. The Sainsbury's remained outwardly unperturbed, but for the moment any thoughts of the gift and the collection were overshadowed by the sheer impact of playing host and hostess to nearly 350 people. For the Sainsbury's and their guests alike, it was for the moment a pure celebration. In the crowd there were familiar faces from the past and new friendships to make. It was a party. The melee was a hubbub of anticipation, enthusiasm and an exchange of ideas. There were experts who had come to see for themselves. Philip Dowson, the architect. Osbert Lancaster, the stage and lighting designer, better known as a cartoonist. Never far away, now approaching his 80th birthday, Henry Moore. These were all friends of the Sainsbury's. They had probably been entertained in their own private house. But this was the big occasion, and for some perhaps a bit daunting. But while the exchange of ideas continued, and those who knew began to form an opinion, things began to change. Glasses were filled less frequently, and the party began to disperse into the building. The magic was beginning to work. As people moved from the reception area and became distributed among the collection, they began to absorb some of what the Sainsbury's and Foster had been working for. Now they were living and moving freely, flanked by sculpture and canvases. They could walk or talk, and be distracted by an object of beauty or a painting, whenever they wished. For one person in particular, it was a time for reflection. Erica Browson was a key figure in a chain of friendships which sprang up in the Sainsbury household. She was the dealer who did more to put the painter Francis Bacon on the map than anyone. The Sainsburys were early and enthusiastic patrons of Bacon, and part of their gift to the university is the biggest and probably the best collection of paintings by Bacon outside the Tate Gallery. Bacon is a passionate admirer of particular artists and their work. This is his study for a portrait of Van Gogh. It was the Sainsbury's who introduced Bacon to Giacometti and sparked off a friendship which was to last until Giacometti died in 1966. In the art world, there is often an intricate web of friendships and professional dealings, like the relationship between Browson and Bacon. The Sainsbury household has often been at the centre of that web and so each piece that has come through that household has its own story. There is an aura about the collection. The gift consists not just of the collection or just of the building. What it really is, is the blending of the two. The building was made around the collection and around the thoughts and intentions of the collectors themselves. The place is an institution, but the collection is personal and intimate. The problem was how to bring the two together without one offending the other. The marriage could only be achieved by subjecting everything to the display itself. The inside of the building is big, but deliberately grey and unassuming. Highlights, barriers and definitions are made with an interplay of light which makes the whole exhibition a work of art on its own. The designers found themselves embarked on a voyage which took them into unfamiliar seas. In the academic world, nothing quite like this had ever been attempted before. Natural and artificial light are manipulated in such a way that a visitor is compelled to make his own interpretation.
A certain critic said, of course, you don't really like painting, do you, Bob? You like Modigliani because they are the paintings of someone who also sculpted. My wife always says that with, for example, Giacometti, I never found any difficulty. I looked at it and liked it. And when people said, how peculiar, I didn't understand what they meant. I found nothing peculiar. It was all perfectly a natural to me. I think the only way I can explain it is that I, I tend to look at all art from a formal point of view and above all a non-intellectual point of view. There are works of art which one knows are very beautiful which one doesn't want to possess. The only comparison that I can make is this. A woman walks into the room where there are a lot of men, and every man in the room agrees that that particular woman is very beautiful. Another woman walks into the room, and no one looks at her except one man who would like to sleep with her. is very, very personal. I mean, to say what's in it, what's not in it, uh, the actual choice of cultures to collect, and the choice of things within those cultures, those are all clearly the results of personal decisions. That the, making the collection has been a form of creativity, almost as much as painting a picture, that it's painting a self-portrait. The, the reason you get Francis Bacon side by side with Art is that two people's sensibilities respond in that way. And I think uh, that in turn, the building, unexpected as it is, is a very personal expression, not only of emotions about art, but of ideas about education, which are held by the donors. If I was asked the origin of the gift to UEA, or the, the, the fact that we decided to give it away and to give it to a university, I think I would say that I desire the young to have the opportunity of looking at works of art in a natural way. I suppose one could put it that I would like some young people to have the same opportunities as my own children of growing up in an atmosphere in which there are works of art. Sir Robert had set himself an extraordinarily difficult task. Because of their unerring choice, he and his wife had amassed a collection which, though private, was admired by international authorities. So inevitably, the giving of it to the University of East Anglia was a gesture to be compared with Fitzwilliam, Ashmole and Courtauld. UEA was now in the big league. But if the intimacy of growing up in an atmosphere of fine art was to be preserved, could UEA also cope with the public acclaim? One hopes that lots of people will come and see it because it is one of the most magnificent gifts made this century, I should think, without any question. I would say that it's, that it's a very rare collection uh, on the one hand 
and that the combination of that collection with this building is a very rare thing. I would say that that together makes it into one of the, well, what should one say, five or six uh, most interesting museum buildings of the last decade internationally. I'm a bit frightened when I, when I went in because um, the building was very alien. I'm not used to seeing the Sainsbury objects in that sort of setting. But the color, the, the light as it came through onto the uh, sculptures and the paintings was so very beautiful, so um, pearly gray and without harsh contrasts and so on, that immediately one, one felt this is the most delightful place to be in, even on a very dull and miserable morning. I was a little frightened by the size of that building. It looked as, as though we were going to find a Concorde inside it or something like that. And remembering how small and delicate and beautiful are the major part of uh, Robert Sainsbury's collection, uh, I wondered how the scale of these little things would fit into such an enormous building. But uh, once one got into it and got settled down into it, I, that didn't worry me any longer because I think it's chiefly because the quality of those exhibits is so extraordinary, it's so high and everything could be seen individually without any trouble of things around it. You could see it in the round, get round the sculpture and, and see it beautifully in that way. Uh, I had been very frightened about it. I had felt that um, the need for security and the need for having some kind of formal display would perhaps steal some sort of goodness out of the objects, you know, that a, a little Greek cycladic figure that looked very intimate and special in a, in a small room in Smith Square would suddenly break up under the strain and become an anonymous thing that uh, had no connection with the past or the present. But I felt that the moment one moved in on to, to the, these things that um, their integrity was totally preserved, which might be because they were very well displayed, which I'm sure they were, but perhaps even more because they're very remarkably good objects and that they're capable of standing the, the shift from that very personal situation to a very public one. And I think possibly this is almost a, an objective way of, of um, congratulating Bob on, on what he's chosen, because I think anything that had been near rubbish would literally have broken up under the strain of that, that degree of display. Bob Sainsbury uh, has never pretended to be an art historian. He's bought things individually because he loves them or because uh, they, they've taken his fancy for one reason or another. And because of that, he's followed his own bent and he's, he's bought with uh, great insight and uh, I think usually with great success and all to, right, right from the earliest times right up to people working now. So from that point of view, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful range for any student to be able to see in actuality. The opening had taken place during the Easter vacation. As soon as the university came back for the summer term, the School of Fine Arts and Music began to settle into its new quarters. The centre provided an entirely new study area less formidable than the library or seminar rooms. It became a kind of common room for serious activities, rubbing shoulders with fine art and the slide collection. Among the voices of dissent, the first to die were those from the School of Fine Arts. Very soon, the students became used to a more informal way of learning in their revolutionary new building. These painted portraits as they survived. Um, during the Roman period, it became conventional to replace those heads with these flat painted portraits. So you have here the interesting thing of a rather live looking um, youth who was quite indubitably dead when the portrait was actually painted. Well, what would this be painted in? It's a wax encaustic technique. It's something the study of fine arts is one of comparison the... and analysis. Slides, books, pictures, and now the real thing. The more you have to see and handle, the more progress you make towards understanding what it is that gives a work of art quality. Mixed with the formidable library of books and prints, the Sainsbury Centre will surely have a considerable impact on the university itself. 
I think it should fulfill the, the university's needs very well, because what I missed when I was a student, and I went to Oxford where the opportunities were much greater than, than they are normally, for example, at a new university like this one, uh, was the, when I began to get interested in art, I missed the intimate contact with it, even in the Ashmolean. Well, where I think the students here are terrifically lucky is that understanding art is particularly sculpture, which this collection is about sculpture, not about painting, uh, is, is handling things, being very close to them, of, of being able to, to feel the form as well as just to see it. And I think that they're all offered an opportunity, and I suspect because the opportunity is so great, uh, they're going to make very good use of it, that they're going to find all sorts of paths in themselves, the students here, which they didn't know they possessed. I expect to find a very strong department growing up, simply because uh, the setting is so conducive, it's so well planned to that end. It's very sculpted, I mean, on both sides. Both sides are exactly the same. Nothing would give Robert and Lisa Sainsbury more pleasure than to see these I mean, first-year students oh, handling this Mexican side, greenstone right. head which was bought for the collection several months after the building was opened. These eyes and these earrings would be filled with some gemstones. Yeah. It might have been set into... While they're speculating on the origins of an individual piece, a university lecture is being conducted in a public area of a public building. What is happening at UEA is a logical progression of a lifetime's effort. Sir Robert's approach to art is not academic or historical. His is a gut reaction. It's a sensual one, and out of it has come experience and knowledge. His pleasure comes from handling art and from having it as part of his private life. What he has given the University of East Anglia is not just a collection and a building, but a whole philosophy as well. I think it's probably already better known outside this country than inside it. I mean, I've been wondering whether Norfolk really realizes just what it's got. Um, because I'm sure it will be something which people will make pilgrimages to come and see. It is a collection of that quality. And it means that this university, at one bound, is placed really well into the World League as far as art collections goes.